Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to A House Divided. My name is Bjorn Skaptison, and we are coming to you today from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Now, there's a little bit of a different uh, wrinkle to today's program. It is a special program, and it is coming to, to, to you today in partnership with the Lincoln Heritage Museum at Lincoln College in Lincoln, Illinois. So today's House Divided is a, a combination uh, for you, coming to you from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop and uh, the Lincoln Heritage Museum in Lincoln, Illinois. We thank the folks at uh, Lincoln Heritage Museum for participating. Now, our guest today, whom you shall meet in just a moment, uh, is Annette Gordon-Reed, and her book is on Juneteenth coming to us from Live Right Publishing. It's 148 pages. The cost is $15.95. And if you wish to order a copy of On Juneteenth from us during the course of this program, we are going to put a link in the comments. Uh, now, of course, those of you who are watching the program live, you know you are watching it on Facebook Live, and you may ask questions of Professor Gordon Reed in the comments section of Facebook Live. Many of you will be watching this later at our YouTube uh, channel. And of course, you will not be available live to answer your questions then, but I do hope that you enjoy it. But of course, if you're watching live on Facebook, please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section and feel even more than free to order a copy of the book. Uh, it has been signed by the author on a custom book plate. Thank you, Professor Gordon Reed, for assigning those book plates for us. Okay, Very uh, let me tell you a little bit before I introduce our author about the Lincoln Heritage Museum. The Lincoln Heritage Museum at Lincoln College is a nationally recognized Abraham Lincoln Museum in Lincoln, Illinois. The Lincoln Heritage Museum pairs impressive Lincoln, an impressive Lincoln collection. Uh, with an immersive audiovisual experience to interpret Abraham Lincoln's life in a totally unique way. And I am going to, if you'll forgive me for a minute, I am going to launch a quick PowerPoint here so that you can see a few awesome photographs of Lincoln College and the Lincoln Heritage Museum. Uh, it really is, uh, we call it, it's uh, just down the street from what we call the elephant in Illinois, the great big uh, Springfield, the Abraham Lincoln uh, Library there in Springfield, but just 30 minutes down the road, an artifact-based museum on, dedicated to the life of President Abraham Lincoln at Lincoln College. And I don't know if our author knows this, this might be a piece of trivia, Lincoln, Illinois is the only city in the US named for Abraham Lincoln, but not for President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the uh, um, surveyor, surveyed Lincoln, Illinois, and that's why they called Lincoln, Illinois, Lincoln, Illinois. Okay. Uh, thank you to Olivia, pa Olivia Partlow, the director of Lincoln Heritage Museum, and Ron Keller, the director of the Abraham Lincoln Center for Character Development. And we will meet, uh, we will hear a little bit from them later, but they're not going to be, uh, uh, they're not going to join us live. Let me introduce our author for today. Uh, again, the, uh, the book on Juneteenth, and the author is Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. Uh, Professor Gordon Reed is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family. She's the author, also the author of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and many other things, uh, and now the, the author of On Juneteenth. Uh, Annette Gordon Reed is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard University, and uh, Let's uh, virtually welcome Annette Gordon-Reed to A House Divided. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And, um, and I 
guess since a lot of since a major part of this um, book is memoir, mm -hmm. uh, if you'll forgive me, I will open our talk with a little bit of Bjorn Skaptesen memoir. And if it goes more than 60 seconds, make sure to shock me uh, so that we can get right to your book. But here's, here's a little bit of my memoir for our discussion. Um, uh, I am a proud, very proud uh, native of the great state of Kansas. And so I, am, I understand anybody that loves their hometown. About a couple of decades ago, my big brother, moved to Texas uh, for his job and he, and he bought a house in a community north of Texas known as the Woodlands. And uh, a few years ago, my mother retired, bought a little house in the community of Magnolia, which is just north of the Woodlands, which is just north of Houston, uh, in an area that I guess we shall call the Big Thicket in mm -hmm. Texas. And just last March, in my memoir, just last March, I traveled to Magnolia uh, to be with my mom and my brother, and we had a doctor's appointment for mom in the town of Conroe, which was just north of Magnolia, and during that visit to the doctor, we decided, hey, let's take a tour around the city of Conroe and see what is there. And we drove around, of course, we saw the DMV and the Montgomery County Courthouse. <laughs> we saw the old movie theater. We saw a wall where they had painted portraits of uh, people who had come from Conroe, uh, murals on the wall, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author from Conroe, the Hazard <laughs> mural, mural on the wall, the Booker T. Washington High School, we saw that. Um, and then as soon as I got back, to my office in Chicago, I found sitting on my desk a review copy of On Juneteenth. <laughs> That's amazing. Annette Gordon Reed, who I had just seen on that mural in Conroe, Texas. That's a little bit of my biography. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Annette Gordon Reed, tell us a little bit about why, after sp spending years writing about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, why did you want to write about? Juneteenth and your memories of your hometown, Conroe, Texas. Well, you know, I've been thinking for a while at the instigation, really, first of my editor, Bob Weil, about doing a book about Texas. But we were thinking about doing a big book about Texas, a history of Texas uh, that would talk about slavery, but one that would use at some level, in some way, my family story to tell this history. And I kept putting it off and putting it off and thinking about other projects that I had to do. And this past year, which as you know, has been a very interesting year for oh, all yes. Americans. Uh, I had done a, an essay for the New Yorker about the holiday Juneteenth. And when that appeared, well, we got the idea that maybe now was the time for me to expand on that, to talk not just about Juneteenth, but to do a book that talked about the lead up, why there had to be a Juneteenth. Why did there have to be a day when enslaved, when the enslaved people were freed? You know, what, how did we get there? So the lead up to, to Juneteenth, mainly talking about the history of Texas and the history of slavery in Texas, and to talk a little bit about the aftermath, but to do it in a way that was personal, that brought it back to my family and to sort of weave that story into the larger story of Texas. So this is a book that was done during the pandemic. Uh, it's pandemic uh, special. Uh, and I was here in Manhattan with my husband and my son and we were in, you know, in, at, what was called ground zero pretty much of right. uh, the COVID uh, uh, epidemic, pandemic. Uh, I have a, a place in Cambridge, Massachusetts that we could have gone to, but it would have been very different than where we are. So we pretty much hunkered down here and I wrote this book. And I think what made it even, I suppose the, the impetus to make it more personal came from the fact that I was, and when you're in a situation like this, you're thinking a lot about mortality 
you're thinking about, I was thinking about my parents and how they would, what they would have made of this very strange time and they're no longer living, but what would they have made of this very, very strange time? And so all of this came together to make for a very you know, introspective <laughs> uh, look at, at history and putting my family in the midst of all of that. And I wanted to do something that was accessible to you know, different groups of people, different age groups, something not so long. And the Hemings is 800 pages. I mean, it had to be that long for the thing that I was trying to do, but this, I wanted to do something different here and to, to talk about Texas in a way that I had not seen it talked about before. Um, right. This has an image. And I say in the book, the image is of a white man. And I'm not a white man, but I'm a Texan. And what is the state like? What is this place like for people who are not the image of Texas that most people have? A cowboy um, or gunfighters or oil people, you know, the businessmen and the oil business or whatever. And uh, what is it like for people who are not like that? And so that's what I wanted to do. Talk about Texas. Talk a little bit about me, something historians don't do. Uh, generally, it's generally about other people's families that I've been looking at. And, and I should say, finally, that this is the kind of writer, I always wanted to be a writer growing up, I thought I was going to be a writer. And this is the kind of writing that I thought I would be doing. You know, that I would be, you know, my hero would be James Baldwin, for example, who was as I was growing up. And but that kind of thing, writing for magazines, maybe doing a screenplay, hanging out in Paris. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course, you know, yeah. that kind of thing, uh, cafes and, and writing the, these kinds of essays, which I think is probably my uh, uh, strong suit as a writer, that that's the kind of writing I like to do. And so it's in a way, it's almost coming back to something that makes talking about family, talking about my home state, but coming back to a style of writing, a way of writing that I always wanted to do. Okay, great. Well, the uh, Americans know that Texas is different. Yes. We know that from Texans. Yes, yes we are, we're <laughs> constantly saying that all the time. Uh, <laughs> so tell us about, tell us about how, tell us about your reaction to the realization, when you had the realization that Juneteenth was starting to become a national holiday. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, it was when I went off to college and I started hearing that other people outside of Texas were celebrating it. And I was a little possessive about it. I thought that this was something that belonged to Black Texans in particular, even though it became a state holiday in 1980 while I was in college. So it was not just blacks who were supposed to be celebrating this. It was all Texans who were supposed to be celebrating it. I, I felt a sense of possessiveness about it. And then I realized that, and I've since realized of what had happened, of course, is that as Texans went other places, they took the holiday with them. And if they moved out to California, if they moved to Chicago or whatever, uh, they talked about it and it became something, it, it caught on because we don't ha really have a day to commemorate um, the end of slavery. And this is of course, not the end of slavery totally, that ends with the ratification of the, um, of the 13th amendment. But this was the end, the marker of the end of the armed conflict when the army of the trans Mississippi finally gives up. You know, they'd given up, the Army of Northern Virginia had given up at Appomattox, but they were still fighting in the Southwest. And once this stopped, once they realized that there was no place for them to go, even though they won the last battle of the Civil War, the Confederates did, right. they, uh, yeah, yeah, they did, but they decided they couldn't go on and they surrendered at the beginning of June. And that's when Gordon Granger got his orders to go to Galveston with his troops and make this announcement about emancipation. So I realized that even though this is something that had to do with Texas immediately, it was a momentous thing for the country as a whole, the end of the armed conflict. I mean, 
obviously there were skirmishes. There were there were people, vigilantes, and people who were perpetrating violence against the former enslaved all throughout the area for decades. Uh, but the army gives up, and then Granger can come in and make this announcement about the end of slavery, and I think very importantly, talking about the former enslaved occupying a plane of equality, that they're supposed to exist now uh, in a state of equality with the people who are their former enslavers, which is an extraordinary thing for him to have written and probably gave, well, I, I would imagine gave a lot of hope to the enslaved, but enraged a number of, of the whites who were in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, I consider, uh, I consider this a Civil War book. We sell Civil War books, so I'm telling telling our customers. You have to tell you how sc how scary that is to me. Okay. Because I will mean, tell you why. Yeah. Because please. because you know I write about Jefferson, and there are a lot of Jefferson buffs out there, right? So right. anything you say, they're going to be people who know or think they know all kinds of things about Jefferson. The Civil War people. Oh yeah, are really really passionate about this subject, and if you yes, say anything, and, and I'm scared, you know, because I'm not a civil, I'm not a, I'm not a. This is not my specialty, so I, it's sort of a daunting thing to think of it as the Civil War so, book because I well, know I'm going to have a lot of people it, on my tail here. Okay. Uh, well, let me tell you why I think it is a Civil War book and why I think it's going to be a very successful Civil War book in its contribution uh, to that story. Uh, I am going to put it on on my shelf next to the classic uh, Tony Horwitz memoir mm -hmm. of the Civil War, Confederates in the Act. Yes, yes. It doesn't mean that I think this is a Confederate book. It means that I think- <laughs> No, no. Uh, it that's deserves- a great book. <laughs> hmm? I I'm honored. It, that's a great book. Oh yeah. Um, and, but it deserves that place with, for, first of all, as a memoir where, the, where you make yourself part of the story and your interaction with the Civil War as part of the story. And part of what makes Horowitz's book so good is that he's, his whole book is asking the question of why do we think that this is the Civil War? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we think these are Confederates? And how does that in some ways part with that? And what, what no, I wrote this down, so if you'll pardon me when I'm, when I'm looking over at my notes, but um, uh, this stuff has not, this, the stuff you write about, mm -hmm. emancipation and the experience of emancipation has not heretofore found a place in Civil War history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so what are we, the Civil War readers, missing when we fail to address the experiences of the people, the living people, mm -hmm. whose relationship to the Civil War is, is personally emancipation mm -hmm. and not fighting battles and not being North and not being South. Mm -hmm. What have we missed by not looking at it from this point of view? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, a lot, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> because it's obviously the, you know, the, it's the apotheosis of the whole of this battle. It's the end of, of it's an end and a beginning mm -hmm. all in one. And I, one of the things that I've said is about the thinking about Juneteenth as uh, a commemoration of the hope that these partic particular people had after the war, after the end of this great struggle, and some of the, the hostility towards them because they now occupied a different place uh, than they did before the war. And people were trying to figure out, or, or, or in some senses, dead set against a new regime coming into being, but it's all a part. Yeah, it, it's all a part of that that struggle. It's just the it's not the not the battle, not on the battlefield, but still still a conflict um, right. that continues in a different venue. Right, and and to follow up I, uh, on that, I, I it, my experience reading Civil War for most of my life is some, and this goes all the way to the finer historians. You know, previous generations who've written about it is that there's something called civil war and then there's something else called civil rights mm -hmm. and they're not the same books mm -hmm. and you don't mm -hmm. study them yeah. together yeah. now this is changing and has been changing for about 20 years 
yeah or yeah or so mm -hmm. uh but it's still very easy and i have i have experience working in national park service and seeing the people that you know go to battlefields and, and working with them and stuff like that and it's still very easy to look around this world and see not hostility the way it was when right after it but to see that the people that the people that wish to encounter the civil war and learn about the civil war if you talk about this other thing they go no no, no that's civil rights that's mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. other thing and i'll mm -hmm. learn about that too but not now yeah <laughs> yeah put it over everything's in a box in a right. different silo and uh and you have to as you're suggesting it's important to break that down and to understand the relationship uh, this is how you make sense of what what's happening here mm -hmm. and um, historians as you said are beginning to do that more more often now yeah yeah let's move let's move uh, a little deeper into the book and I know you have several the book for the folks at home is organized into several chapters that are kind of standalone essays mm -hmm. uh, that talk about Professor Gordon Reed's childhood in mm -hmm. Texas and how that interacted with uh, emancipation, mm -hmm. thus Juneteenth, as, as she explained mm -hmm. to us. One of the stories that I thought made your town of Conroe so compelling was the case of Bob White, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, a, a case uh, that has, has to, to, that involves um, a contest between, uh, huh, between, a conflict over <laughs> civil rights many years later mm -hmm. that is pretty awful yeah. uh, to have to think about. So could you just tell the folks who haven't read the book yet mm -hmm. a little bit about Bob White and, and what that case meant? It was a national case. Yes. Uh, the story of Bob White was a story that I first heard from my grandfather uh, many years ago. And it was a focal point for the African-American community in Livingston and Conroe. I was born in Conroe. And when I was a, a baby, my family moved, excuse me, I was born in Livingston. And when my baby was, when I was a baby, I was moved, we moved to Conroe, Texas. So these two cities, these two, not cities, these towns were figure mightily in the Bob White story. So Bob White was uh, a farm laborer who, came to pick cotton in Livingston, Texas and a place that was still called the plantation during that time. And he was accused of raping a white woman, uh, Ruby Cochran. And while he was in jail, the Texas Rangers would come at night and take him out to the woods, tie him to a tree and they beat him until he confessed. And this, you know, he was sentenced to die in the electric chair for the rape. And this went up through the court system and, and he was convicted at first and went up with, on appeal with his lawyers arguing that this was, it, it violated the constitution, that this, this confession was, you know, was wrongly, you can't beat people until they confess. Eventually the case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court which I didn't know. And it's funny because I teach criminal procedure and I teach 14th, the 14th Amendment you know, do, and, and confessions, but I use other cases. The casebook that I use uses other cases, not White v. Texas. So it's somewhat interesting to me that, you know, that this would, I didn't know this. I knew this as a family story about, not, he did not in my family, but a story that my grandfather used to tell. Um, and the Supreme Court holds that yes, indeed, um, taking somebody out and beating them until they confess is a violation of the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment, the due, due process clause. So they send it back down. And while they're in Conroe, retrying the case, Ruby Cochran's husband shoots Bob White in the courtroom in front of everybody, judge, jury, everyone. And eventually, not eventually, very quickly is acquitted for murder, even though Everybody had seen what happened. And this was so demoralizing to, it, it shattered 
uh, the black community because and I, I think about what it must have been like now that I know the procedural history of this before it was just the story my grandfather told me uh, the procedural history of this that there were glimmers of hope along the way because the courts were saying that this is you know that this is he kept getting he got new trials mm -hmm. and people thought that justice might be done in some fashion now the the side story to this is and this is important for historians because there was a counter narrative about this that was in the black community and that my grandfather told me he said that the two of them ruby and bob white were the phrase he used was going together which is you know seeing one another having an affair or whatever and when the husband found out about it or was teased about it or whatever it turned into a story of rape now, for historians, I don't know what the story, I don't know the truth or the falsity of that, of that claim, but historian, you work in historical, you know, you look at documents and oral histories and so forth, you have very often these competing narratives about what happened in a given situation. But the bottom line was that he got shot in a courthouse in front of all of these people and when the guy was acquitted, everybody cheered. And this caused, this, gave, this sort of further added to the really bad reputation that, Con that Conroe had on race. There had been lynchings before then, a man had been burned at the stake, burned alive at the stake on the courthouse grounds in the 20s, like 10 years before, or 10 or 12 years before the Bob White situation. So Conroe had a reputation, has a reputation of being very, very hard um, on the racial front, and because of this this kind of violence, the Klan activity, and so forth, as well. Right. So this creates a uh, this creates a. I like I like how you use the word counter narrative. I mean that that makes sense. And mm -hmm. even to jump back briefly to the topic of this is a civil war book, we think we know the civil war because there's one narrative. There's a counter narrative to everything. Yes. And, and this helps to, even though it's an event that occurred in the thirties, mm -hmm. it helps to illustrate that. Yeah. Uh, it, it absolutely, it absolutely is, is still tied to the long, the long struggle, the long civil oh, war. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a, you know, slavery was an economic system where people worked and didn't get paid, but it was also because it was racialized, racially based it created a hierarchy and a hierarchy that benefited and that benefited even whites who were not slave owners. Mm -hmm. um, they, it gave people who were poor, it gave people who were relatively powerless, something that they could uh, hold on to. You know, I may be destitute, I may not have a lot, but I'm better than a black person. And I have power over black people, and I have a privilege over black people, privileges that black people don't have, and like being able to walk into a courthouse and shoot somebody uh, yes. and, and get off, you know. Um, After the Supreme so, Court said. And the Supreme Court said that, you know, what had happened, that, you know, this was, this was uh, cruel, unusual punishment. But in any event, so by the time, all of the things that happened up until, you know, through slavery in the aftermath with the creation of Jim Crow, all of this, this, all this stuff lingers in a place like Texas. There's a memory of this stuff, even if it's not spoken of all the time, but this Bob White was spoken of because my, as I said, my grandfather told this story and other people knew it because it was notorious that, that something like this, it was one thing to have people, a mob, you know, dragging somebody out of their house and lynching them, that's terrible and it's tragic. But to have the legal system, you know, fall apart in that way, the rule of law, to show it to be a sham and non-existent, that really broke a lot of people's spirit. I had uh, an aunt who, a couple of people, more than uh, members of my family, who would not spend the night in Conroe. I mean, they'd come to visit us or whatever, but they wouldn't stay because the, the town just freaked them out. The whole idea of, of something like that happening, even after they remember that, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, you could say, oh, that's in the past, forget about it. But it was embedded in a culture where there was segregation, where when I went to 
the doctor's office. I went to a separate waiting room. When we went to the movies, we had to sit in the balcony. Uh, and you know, I was the person who integrated our school district. So all of this, the racial hierarchy, the racial understandings of how people were supposed to act, those were real and they were, they'd been put in place a long time ago. And the echoes of all of that, the part of this structure of the town and the culture and attitudes was still very much present when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. We're about halfway through our discussion. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna step aside from the, uh, the thread of discussion that we've had mm -hmm. uh, thus far, because I wanna share uh, a question with you from uh, Ron Keller. Mm -hmm. uh, from the Lincoln Heritage Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron asks, uh, a New York Times review of your book noted that in, writing, that in writing it on Juneteenth, that you had to revisit your own assumptions about history. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on those assumptions, uh, elaborate with what those assumptions were and what you discovered differently in the process. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things, I, I, there are a number of places where I, and historians encounter this a lot. You think you know how something works and then you go to the archive and you find out, no, that's not how it works. Uh, I had to think about one prominent, one area that I write about is Native Americans, the, the relationship between African-American people and indigenous people. Uh, having grown up in a household with a father who romanticized the relationship between Native Americans and indigenous people and uh, African Americans, thinking that because they were in conflict with European Americans, Anglo Americans, that somehow there was a natural alliance between the two of them, and there was not. And I don't know, my father's no longer living. I don't know the extent to which he understood that there were some Native American people who held African American people as slaves. And that that is still has been a point of contention in modern times as, as every, we're talking about the country going through a reckoning on race. There is a reckoning, there is a discussion now about that somewhat fraught relationship between some Native groups and African American people. And so I grew up thinking that there was this affinity and it took you know, a while reading and so forth in college to understand that things were not as simple as I thought they were. And you know, that there were, there's no natural alliance among anybody that their people have their own interests in some places, in some ways and other ways that they, they feel that they're in contention with one another. So I think that's probably, that's one area where I've uh, had to, to think, you know, to think about that connection, those connections and what they actually mean. Um, to think about as well, the responses of white people to desegregation not making excuses for them, obviously, but you're forced to think about what people lose, what people think they're losing. And that's why storekeepers were uh, cruel to us. You know, when I, I talk about going into a store where we weren't supposed to go there, my parents didn't want us to go there because the person, the proprietor was so, so uh, unkind and disrespectful, but sometimes you'd go in to get bubble gum or whatever. But to you know, to think Kid about, yeah, yeah, you know, to think about, you know, what is going on with this guy? You know, what is going on with this person? Not excusing his behavior, but instead of thinking, oh, this is just random hatefulness, what was in it for him to act like that? And it's back to what I was saying before about this notion of a hierarchy, of mm -hmm. what that means to, in the South, to white people who don't have, may not have necessary, may not necessarily have real wealth or real power, but that margin of difference between black and white uh, that helped prop up a system of racial hierarchy in, in, in places like Texas. Okay. Uh, I also have a, a, a question that, I'm glad you sort of took it that way because I have a question that in some ways dovetails with that from one of the volunteers at Lincoln Heritage Museum. And uh, this question is that you detail the complicated history of Texas, 
-hmm. And then the question is, how do Texas schools deal today with that complex history, particularly the, particularly the dark chapter of the treatment of slaves and Native Americans? And do you see any indication that history, as it is being taught today in schools, is still being whitewashed or downplayed? Mm -hmm. Well, people take, uh, kids take history, Texas history in the fourth grade and seventh grade in Texas. Mm -hmm. And I gather from what I have been seeing in recent years, it's certainly different, it's certainly better than what I got as a student. People are much more open in talking about these issues. Uh, but recently, very recently, there's been a backlash against that kind of openness. And I, you may have heard of uh, efforts in Texas to, <coughs> excuse me, foster patriotic education. Uh, there's something called Project 1836, sort of mm -hmm. taking off of Project 1619. 1836 being the year when the Texas Republic was formed. And sort of, you know, they claim that it's not really outlawing discussions of race and so forth. But you could, if you look at the, the bill, the law, it would, will chill people. I mean, you, there were people who say, what, why would I want to get in trouble? It'd be easier to just sort of avoid this kind of thing. So I think there's been an opening up of these kinds of discussions, but there's been a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that not just in Texas, but across uh, the, the country, there has been a reaction against critical race theory or whatever, you know, as if people don't, as if people really know what that is. I mean, right. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's sort of a distortion of what it's, what it's about, but yeah, so I, things have gotten better and when I go, when I've gone back to Texas, and if I can tell just from, um, you know, seeing students and and talking to my nieces and so forth about what they're doing, things have opened up. But now we're in a moment when there seems to be a pushback against teaching being much more expansive in the kinds of things that are taught. Right. Right. Well, uh, thank you for those questions from Lincoln Heritage Museum. And I'm going to keep an eye on the questions that are coming in uh, from the folks who are watching. And uh, if I have a chance to in, in the uh, next 20 minutes or so to get uh, more questions from the Lincoln Heritage Museum community, uh, I'll be happy to do that. And please feel free to, to, to ask other questions as we go. Uh, and if we have time, we'll get to them. One of the things that we can do, uh, uh, again, if you're watching this on Facebook, you may, may not know exactly where it's coming from. One of the things that we can do at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago is share historical artifacts with our viewers. And bald face commercialism, yeah, they're for <laughs> sale. That's what we do. <laughs> Just like this little book is for sale, uh, we have other things for sale too. I'm not going to waste your time in this conversation saying, hey, buy this, buy that, and you know, just try. But I am going to share something that is the kind of thing that you can that you can find that is historical artifacts and something that that you can bring into your life that is a connection to history. And in this case, something that has that might have a connection with Juneteenth and with the subject of this book. And I'm gonna share it with a, uh, it's, it's what you see over my shoulder right here. It's a piece of folk art and you can't really see the details here, but you can get an idea of the scale of it by looking there. And it is a piece of folk art created according to its provenance, uh, created by a freed person immediately after the Civil War and the subject matter is the Lincoln assassination. And I'm showing it to you now. I hope it, I mean, you can see it there, Professor Gordon mm -hmm. Reed. Mm -hmm. And there you see a, a piece of folk art in the schoolhouse uh, tradition of folk art, as they call it. And you see there the subject matter, uh, an African-American person, uh, presumably a freedman, mourning at a sort of idea of what the grave of Abraham Lincoln might be. 
Mm -hmm. um, you have the more you see a morning border. I'm going to point at some things here. A morning border has been placed around it, which is very much something that that artist would have learned would have been a typical of 19th century cultural uh, uh, art, you know. Um, and then you see the trees in the background, they're willows. Um, and then Abraham Lincoln, our nation has lost its father, 1809 to 1865. Professor Gordon Reed, what do you think of in terms of being an historian of the time of emancipation when you see a work of art like this that was created uh, by the people who were affected by emancipation at the time? Mm -hmm. Well, Lincoln as the martyred Lincoln was seen as the person who had been the catalyst for emancipation and there was always a sense of, of a connection to him, um, even though it's popular now, because I think it's right to say that African-American people, enslaved people, a lot of them emancipated themselves by running away, uh, by breaking the Southern system once the war starts, by leaving. But Lincoln was symbolic, incredibly symbolic as a person who was seen to have stood against, who made the war about uh, the issue of slavery and African-Americans, many people in the African-American community revered him. He had, Douglas had some issues with him. Frederick Douglass had issues with him that he wasn't moving fast enough. Um, the real solid abolitionist wanted more radical action from him uh, from the very, very beginning. But Douglas came to see that he had ended up, you know, giving his life for this and that he had maneuvered through some very, very difficult terrain uh, during, uh, during the war and was seen as a friend of African-American people. Now, we mentioned that he was for colonialism, uh, colonization, they mentioned these as, as he's not, doesn't have the racial views that we have today that we like, that we think are the, the proper racial views for, the, for this particular moment. But, you know, he got shot. I mean, for what he believed in and, and the people, the enemies of African-American people saw him as an enemy. And therefore, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but it was even more than that. They knew, many African-American people knew that he was sincere in his belief that slavery was wrong. And he had given his life for that for that because people saw him as someone who would bring about this equality. I mean, you know, the, the Gettysburg Address that talks about equality, which I think is Granger's order connects him to Lincoln in talking about equality. Uh, this sort of, and he does this on the basis of the Emancipation Proclamation and that word equality that Lincoln uses from the Declaration of Independence hearkening back to that ideal that Black people, when they heard it, uh, took very much to heart in the 18th century, sort of establishing, establishing Lincoln as a friend, as close to a friend as a white person could be uh, for that time period. Right, right. And, uh, and of course, uh, it, on the issue of General Granger and his General Order Number 3, uh, it was the president that issued general order number one mm -hmm. of 1863, mm -hmm. which is the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's this, it seems to be a practical, perhaps a, an African-American, a freed person in Texas mm -hmm. in 1865 would definitely have seen a bright line from the Emancipation Proclamation to oh, yeah. general mm -hmm. order number three to let's celebrate this, this day that we all learned mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. emancipation. Okay. And, and Lincoln's death well, was a blow to them, but to, to all people who had been supporters of, of the United States and the, and the army and the, and the cause that, for which they were fighting. Um, so that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that, that uh, a piece of art uh, fits very squarely within this notion of having lost a person who had been, as I said, as much of a of a friend to African-American people as, as a white person could be during that time period in right. his position as a politician. Right. I mean, Garrison, there were other people who were more radical than he sure. and more outspoken 
but not anybody who had the responsibilities. <laughs> John Brown, uh, John yeah. Brown, yeah, not anyone who had, and John Brown too was a reverend fear uh, figure as well, right. but not anyone who had the responsibilities of being president. Right. Makes them, puts them in a different position altogether. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on, move on from this topic and again back into uh, the topic of popular culture. And please forgive me if I come across grouchy. Um, <laughs> And I do not blame you for me uh, suddenly waking up at 5.30 this morning with the theme song of the 1971 Tom Laughlin film, Billy Jack, <laughs> rattling around between my ears. <laughs> but that is what happened. And, uh, and, and, so, and I, love, I love film, I love cinema, and I can tell from your book that so do you and so did you as mm -hmm. a child. Mm -hmm. And you introduce at least two, perhaps three, if I'm forgetting one, uh, films that you saw as a child in Conroe, in, uh, in your local movie palace. Mm -hmm. uh, is this what, the Crichton Theater? Yes, the Crichton Theater. Yeah, and there you, I guess there you got to sit in the balcony. Yep. Uh, when you saw films like Billy Jack or No, by, Bi by Billy Jack, we had moved to the North Hill Cinema, which was integrated by ah, that time. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, the, the part about the book that really, that really sticks with me is, uh, is how the, okay, how the legend of Texas <laughs> Mm -hmm. Texas is legend, Texas is myth, Texas is history. These are all important things and sometimes they conflict with each other. But how much films that you saw or stories that you told, even as children, could be as compelling as the film was supposed to be, such as the Alamo. Yeah. Yet, it, even then, perhaps you said that, well, this doesn't apply to me or how does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. Tell, tell the folks at home a little bit about that experience of just being a kid in the 60s and 70s and living this life in Conroe, which was not great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but mm -hmm. you, you would go to the movie palace and see the films. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to say, I, I'll, I'll push back on that a bit. Okay. I think, I, I think my childhood was great. I mean, Conroe, huh. aside from in, in my, within the cocoon of my community, <laughs> Uh, it was a place, it was a good place to go out and ride your bike and you, you did kid things. And for kids, you don't, as long as if you have your family and security and, you know, th there were things that were bad, but it, it was not, I don't want to make it sound like this was not like, you know, four square oppression, 24 hours a day, white people, they, they didn't really figure into our lives all the time is what I'm, is what I'm getting at. Right. So I would okay. say I had a happy childhood. Yeah. So um, yeah, movies have always been important to me. And it's funny, I, I didn't even realize that I was doing this until I was writing in the book that I was talking about these things through movies. I mean, you know, Giant, <laughs> and uh, which I didn't see in the theater, I saw on television, because obviously that's an older film. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Alamo, the re-release of that, um, I, you know, I didn't think, I, I thought it applied to me because I wasn't thinking, I didn't know at that stage as much about Texas history and understand, did not understand that the people fighting in the Alamo were fighting in part to protect the institution of slavery. I was going to see a film with Jim Bowie who had the really cool knife and the sort of magical knife, like he was the only person in the world who had a knife like that and uh, Davy Crockett and William Travis, who was played by Lawrence Harvey, who was very handsome and dashing. And so I was well into the film. I, it, in, as a kid, I didn't know how complicated this was. Later on, when you think about it, I mean, I did know that there was a figure of the enslaved person in the film who was kind of cringeworthy in a way. I mean, the, the portrayal you know, anytime you, you never knew how African-American people were going to be portrayed in these movies. Uh, but it wasn't until later that I got, I came to understand how weird it would be for a black person to be so enamored of that crew of people when 
you, you learn, learn their background. You know, they're slaveholders, they're slave traders, and they wanted to protect slavery. Now, the Alamo is about valor. It's about standing up for your principles. It's about bravery. You know, Travis draws a line in the sand and, uh, you know, they come over to his side and decide to stay there on this mission where they're going to be slaughtered in the end. Um, so there are there are things, a notion of honor, but if you dig beneath that and you think of what they're fighting for, you think of what their principles were, that, that's what causes conflict. And one of the things that I raise in the book is you know, black people, it's, it's definitely possible, it's necessary for black people to be a part of the history of Texas, but it's a harder thing to think of black people freely participating in the mythology of Texas. Uh, the, the myths that leave out who these guys were and the conflict that Texas had about slavery with Mexico, that Mexico, you know, had outlawed slavery. And I mean, they were looking the other way for, for Texans for a long time, but there was always that insecurity on the part of Texans about, you know, you know is this institution going to be supported or not? And that's one of the reasons they wanted to leave. So as a kid, I took all of this stuff in without knowing all of this. It's only when you become older, a teenager and an adult, when you look at this and say, hmm, how am I supposed to respond to this? What, what am I supposed to make of all of this? Right, right. I have a question here. Thank you very much for that. I have a question here from Daniel Weinberg, who is, uh, uh, who is the owner of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop and mm -hmm. uh, just down the hall, I watching the program, just like the people around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan has a question for you. Uh, and he says, I'll never forget my parents taking me on a train down to Florida back in 1950 and 51. I woke up in my sleeper car one morning in a Georgia station and seeing for the first time a sign for a colored water fountain, quote. Mm -hmm. uh, it truly shocked me, even being only six or seven at the time. Uh, and so Dan asked, the question being, uh, how can non-African Americans, reflecting on this kind of uh, 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 experience, how can non-African Americans participate in Juneteenth? Well, uh, the way they participate. I mean, Juneteenth is, in, in Texas, is a festive thing. Uh, it's typically if you're when we were at home, it was barbecuing. It was it's sort of like a think of the 4th of July. Right. When I was a kid, the 4th of July with black people. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we celebrate the 4th of July as well. No, right. but seriously, how you can participate in it is to talk about this kind of thing, you know, to, to, to no, learn about it, uh, mm -hmm. to think about it, to make it a part of your consciousness, maybe bring these issues up with people who, when they say that there's, you know, deny that this history has any meaning uh, and explain how close we all are to this, that this is not, in the, the United States is a young country to begin with, but the things that we're talking about are just a couple of generations ago, two or three generations ago. I, I found my great, great grandfather's uh, a name on a voter registration list from 1867. Um, and to know that that must have been a very hopeful thing for him. And then to know that, you know, a decade or so later, when Reconstruction ends, we're going to enter this era of, of uh, Jim Crow and voter suppression. And here we are now <laughs> in uh, 2021 with efforts along those lines, prompted to by the participation of large numbers of people of color in the electorate. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that how can you participate in Juneteenth is that some of these issues are recurring and to be vigilant about backsliding, be vigilant about some of those attitudes rearing their ugly head again at, at this particular moment. So we're, you know, Juneteenth is gone and that time period is gone, but some of the issues that are involved are very much with us today still. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think uh, I don't think anybody would uh, uh, would feel bad about having a fourth summer barbecue. 
I know, I know, I know. Although we'd have to barbecue goat, I guess, I if I understand. Yeah, except right? we didn't know, but we didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't do that. But that that was one of the traditional dishes. And I, I still haven't figured out how that got on the menu right. um, for some people. But that that's, I have more to find out about this. Okay. Uh, we're coming up to the end of our time. Uh, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gordon Reed, for joining us. And I'm going to do one more question um, that I found that I got from your book. And let's just say that this question is from T. Jefferson in Monticello in Virginia. Okay. And uh, and Tom's got a deep question, but I guess he's a deep thinker. Uh, but yeah, you address this in the book. So let's let's. Let's just put it in a question here from Tom Jefferson. Uh, how can you love a country that does not love you back? Mm -hmm. A challenge that this book addresses. Mm -hmm. Because the country, I am the country. I'm a part of the country. I don't accept the idea that the country belongs to other people. It belongs to my family. It belongs to my friends. Uh, it belongs to the generations of people who lived in the country and labored in the country and helped build the country. And no one can claim that and, you know, from me as, as take precedence over my allegiances and my right to be here. So I love my country because I loved my mother and my father and my brothers and my grandparents and my friends and all the people with whom I had experiences growing up in this particular place. It's those people, those experiences, those memories, and the hopes that you have for a better life that tie me to this place. So that assume, the question assumes that the United States belongs to a group of people, a certain group of people who would deny me or who would uh, be hostile towards me, but I don't think it does belong just to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to give you very, mu very much time to answer this question. But of course, one of the reasons why we want to hear from you is the years that you spent looking at, uh, at Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. and Sally Hemings. And so can you very briefly or just say, uh, just say has your uh, interaction with Thomas Jefferson how has your interaction, understanding of Thomas Jefferson changed over all of the years that, that you've studied him? Mm -hmm. um, has it really evolved a lot? I, I think it's evolved because I think I've evolved. I've gotten older and I realize how hard it is to do anything in the world. And he did lots of different things. So I think I am probably the sense I, I am more sympathetic mm -hmm. to his failures and weaknesses than I would have been at the very beginning of uh, this journey. And I think that's largely about looking at myself, you know, forgiving myself for my flaws and right. uh, for the ways that I don't live up to the things that I want to, to live up to. So I think it's, that's come with age um, and a, a looking at looking at the world and people, not just him, but the world and people in general, with a more, I hope, a more charitable eye. Okay, okay. Well, I guess we're here just about at the end of the program. I do want to shout out to some of the people who are watching, even though we're not going to be able to uh, ask your questions. Uh, thank you for Bill Gorski and Tom Pete for participating. Uh, I also want to thank uh, some of the fine volunteers at uh, the Lincoln Heritage, uh, the Lincoln Heritage Museum, and oh, I'm afraid I may have uh, lost their names. Oh, here we go: Libby, Curtis, Lynn, Steve, and Dora, uh, valued volunteers at the Lincoln Heritage Museum. Uh, Dave Wiegers and Dave Bradley are two Daves that are regular uh, participants in a house divided. Tom from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Tom, for being back with us. And, uh, and joining us. Again, the book that you can order from the link in Facebook or just go to our website at alincolnbookshop.com. If you're watching this later on the YouTube channel, there'll also be a link under there. Uh, it is on June T on Juneteenth, 
by Annette Gordon Reed. We have we will sell you a copy of it and send it to you with a signed book plate. I will briefly tell you what we have coming up on uh, in the future, in the near future, on a house divided. If you'll forgive me for a moment while I while I get my notes in front of me. On Tuesday, June 1st at 3.30 in the afternoon, Michael Burlingame will be here to discuss his new book, An American Marriage, uh, a book about the marriage between Abraham and Mary Lincoln. On Saturday, June 5th, Timothy B. Smith returns to the program for his book, The Siege of Vicksburg. And that is the next book in a series of books about uh, the Vicksburg campaign. And then I'm thrilled to announce that on the 1st of July, which of course is the anniversary of the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Brian Matthew Jordan will join us to discuss A Thousand May Fall, Life, Death, and Survival in the Union Army and uh, scenes from the Battle of Gettysburg play a very important part in that book. So join us. Uh, for any of those uh, programs, you'll find the details at our website, alincolnbookshop.com. And again, Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations and thank you on, on writing on Juneteenth. Uh, do you have anything for us before we go? No, just thank you. This was a lot of fun. And, and a Civil War book, I guess I'll have to get used to it. Yeah, yes, you've done it. You've written a Civil War book, maybe in spite of yourself. Um, okay, thank you, everybody, for joining us on A House Divided, and we will see you next time.